Sundays at 10 a.m. through Facebook and Radio WMOH on 1450. Both can easily be accessed through our zionhamilton.org website. If you'd like to follow our service through our Sunday bulletin, please call our office at 513-863-5774 or email us at zionlutheranoffice at gmail.com and we'll put you on our weekly distribution. Your financial support helps us to achieve our mission to nurture all people in Christ's love and grace through the guidance of the Holy Spirit and to serve God and community. They can be made through our zionhamilton.org website. For the service today, our first lesson is from Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 7 and 12 through 18. We will then read responsibly Psalm 90, verses 1 through 12. The second lesson is taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And the gospel lesson is taken from Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. Special music today is Here I Am, Lord, which we sung by Stephanie Heights. Today's worship assistants are Pastor Joe Schrock, organist Sarah Kim, lector Robin Kalin, singers Aaron Sanchez and Kathy Fry, Facebook administrator Nathaniel Kalin, and myself, radio announcer Ron Alcorn. We now return you to our worship service. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved. Amen. Holy One, we confess that we are not awake for you. We are not faithful in using your gifts. We forget the least of our siblings. We do not see your beautiful image in one another. We are infected by sin that divides your beloved community. Open our hearts to your coming. Open our eyes to see you in our neighbor. Open our hands to serve your creation. Amen. Beloved, we are God's children, and Jesus, our beloved, opens the door to us. Through Jesus, you are forgiven. 
By Jesus, you are welcome. In Jesus, you are called to rejoice. Let us live in the promises prepared for us from the foundation of the world. Amen. And together we stand and sing, God of grace and God of glory, 705. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
Let us pray. Righteous God, our merciful master, you own the earth and all its peoples, and you give us all that we have. Inspire us to serve you with justice and wisdom, and prepare us for the joy of the day of your coming. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, just one housekeeping note that when we do communion, if you could exit on the right side and go around that side to, to come back to your seats, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and we have exciting news. Our Thrive account is now up to 12,135. So great job in collecting money for Thrive. This is, these are great pledges. And now the readings. The first reading is from Zephaniah 1, 1, 7, 12 through 18. Zephaniah, like the prophet Amos in, the last, in, in last week's first reading, presents the day of the Lord as one of judgment and wrath. Descriptions of the last day in the New Testament include details taken from the Old Testament accounts of the day of the Lord. And now the reading. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. At that time, I will search Jerusalem like with lamps, and I will punish the people who rest complacently on their dregs, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will do no good, nor will he do harm. Their wealth shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inherit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The warrior cries aloud there. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast, and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring such distress upon people that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to serve them or save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his passion, the whole earth shall be consumed for a full terrible end he will make all the inhabitants of the earth. Word of God, word of life. Amen. We will now read responsibly Psalm 90, 1 through 8, 9, 11, 12. Lord, you have been our refuge. From one generation to another. Before the mountains were brought forth or the land of the earth were born. From age to age, you are God. You turn us back to the dust and say, Turn back, O children of earth. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past. And like a watch in the night. You sweep them away like a dream. They fade away suddenly like the grass. In the morning it is green and flourishes. In the evening it is dried up and withered. For we are consumed by your anger. We are afraid because of your wrath. Our inequities have, you have set before you. And our secret sins in the light of your countenance. When you are angry, all our days are gone. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The span of our life is 70 years, perhaps in strength even 80. Yet the sum of them is but labor and sorrow, for they pass away quickly and we are gone. Who regards the power of your wrath? Who rightly fears our indignation? So teach us to number our days. That we may apply our hearts to wisdom. The second lesson is from 1 Thessalonians 5, 11 through 1, 1 through 11. Though we do not know and cannot calculate the day of Christ's return, we live faithfully 
in the here and now as we anticipate the day when we will be given eternal salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And now the reading. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, as indeed you are doing. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. You, Jesus tells a parable about his second coming, indicating that it's not sufficient merely to maintain things as they are. Those who await his return should make good use of the gifts that God has provided them. And here begins the gospel. Jesus said to the disciples, for it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made you two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not snow or sow, and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. For to all, okay, so take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even when they have, will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Be seated. A couple quick announcements. First of all, 
and, and Julia can confirm this for me, but I believe we're down to having enough turkeys. And is there still one more turkey that needs to be cooked? Or are we, okay, all the turkeys are good. They're all cooked, or will be anyway. Um, I believe we still need cookies though, and there's still a few open slots for work in different spots. But Thanksgiving's looking good, even with the rain. So we're good there. Also, for those of you that are tracking, next Saturday is our adoption hearing, and we will try to, if the courts let us, do that Facebook Live. So if those that, that want to see it um, can watch it. Let's see. Also, and I, and I wanted to give a, a thank you. We have somebody that listens by radio, and she sent in a card and, and a couple gifts, and I just want to appreciate the fact that you're not only sending gifts, but also um, listening faithfully. And now, continuing with the readings and the gospel, this is one of those, once again, we're kind of in the rough part of the church here where Jesus is, and the Old Testament readings are, are telling things in a very, if not violent way, certainly a less gentle way of dealing with not only the people of God, but all people. And so you have this story which kind of, on the surface, goes in the opposite direction of what we would think it should go, especially those last couple sentences where we're taken from the people that don't have a lot. But I want to tell a story, and then we'll dig a little bit deeper into all that. Now, some of you may have heard this story before, but we're going to go ahead and talk about it. Have you ever thought about what you do as part of God's mission, whatever your role is in that, whether or not it's actually having an effect. And I suspect there's, that most of us have probably been in that boat at one time or another. But here's a story from the late 1870s. There was a little girl named Annie. Now her mother died. Her father deserted her. She was so wild and crazy that her aunt and uncle didn't want to take care of her anymore. So she ended up in what they used to call industrial homes or orphanages, which needless to say, those are not pleasant places, even in the best ones, and some of them were really bad. And so you have this girl, angry at the world, and she also had, uh, and I'm gonna probably pronounce this wrong, trachoma, which is a painful eye condition that affects your vision, but of course hurts a lot. And, and so this child is, is dealing with being not wanted, living in a place that most people would not want to live, and dealing with constant pain. And needless to say, she kept getting wilder and wilder and more angry and more angry. Certainly they didn't have a lot of therapy back then, and, and the place that she was at wasn't prone to be helpful anyway. And it got so bad that they even started tying her down sometimes. And this, and this is kind of the, the sad statement, and it's part of the reason why it's good that we have different ways of dealing with this. Another inmate named Maggie started caring for her. I think they were roughly around the same age. And at first, things did not go well. Annie would throw food on the floor and curse at her and perhaps even hit her, but Maggie was a Christian, and so she kept trying to get through to her, trying to befriend her and care for her, and it took a long time. Now, I suspect that we've probably been in that situation before, either as Annie or as Maggie, or sometimes kind of a switch of both, and sometimes the length of, of, of caring seems like we're not really getting anywhere. But eventually, Annie started to respond. For the first time in her life, she had somebody that was willing to take care of her despite all of her behaviors and misfortunes, her temper and so forth, and they became friends. Now, Maggie happened to tell her about a school for the blind because she was having vision problems. And so Annie begged to be sent there. And finally, they did allow her to go. And after a series of operations, she got some of her vision back. 
I don't know if the pain ever fully went away, but at least she could see a little bit. And as her vision changed, her heart continued to change. And she finally requested that she wanted to go work with other children, specifically girls, that were having sight problems. And you know, and that's fairly common, speaking from a foster parent's point of view, that the kids dealing with loss and, and trauma and, and, and sometimes physical ailments, the ones that are able to work through those with lots of help do often want to care for other people in their similar situation. And so they sent her to Alabama. Now, I imagine that was a bit of a culture change coming from Massachusetts to go to Alabama, especially in the 1870s and 1880s. But she was sent to work with a, a girl named Helen. Hmm, somebody actually knows who we're going with that. So Annie Sullivan, who for the longest time was just a terror, not necessarily because of her fault, but certainly not heading in a good path, but because one little girl took the time to love her despite all those things, when no one else would, even the people at the home, we ended up getting Helen Keller. And so her initial talents, this Maggie, may have seemed small, and I'm not gonna say that every time we do something it's gonna end up rippling into a big, huge thing like Helen Keller, but that small talent made a difference in one girl's life, and it rippled. You know, it's interesting when you think about this, and I think sometimes we forget about this, those talents, you know, we think talents and coins, and we think little tiny bits of change, and, you know, and, and that's not even counting when we have a coin shortage. But you have a situation where one talent is worth roughly 15 years of labor. Now, of course, everybody makes different amounts of money for their annual wage, but even if you went on minimum wage, that still ends up being quite a bit of money for one talent. And then you have two and five. So five times 15, uh, I'll let you do the math, is a, basically a lifetime of work and a lifetime of wages. And our temptation is to say, well, it's easy to invest a whole lifetime of money and it's harder if you only have 15 years of money or, or talent. But as this story shows, it's not how much you have, but how you use it. Jesus comes out and says that it's not one person making one talent into 15 or 20 or 30 but it is an expectation to use that talent to grow the kingdom. And so that's something that we, that we think about as we're going through this. And I, I wanted to read you something. It's in connection to the hunger grant. And this is from Pastor Katie. And I'm not gonna read you the whole uh, email just cause uh, not all of it's relevant. But this is an example of how Zion as a congregation, taking whatever talents we have and making it better. Zion received the Synod team's highest recommendation. And like I said last week, Zion was the only one selected in the whole Synod for that national hunger grant. People see the ripples and they want to be a part of making a bigger difference in this community. And, and when I had the, the synod uh, partially paid for by Thrive, so thanks again, um, we have a situation where the bishop was on briefly before she went off to another of her many activities. And I, I told her, texted through the chat one-on-one, -on -one, thanked her again. 
And she was very proud of what we're doing here in Hamilton. People notice when talents are used. They also notice when talents are not used. And so often, that makes a difference in people. It took a lot of time for Maggie to use her talents to make a difference. And that's true in most situations because no matter how well you're using the talents, it takes time to build trust, to convince people that you actually care about them. But you notice Jesus doesn't say that it has to be a big harvest. Just that we faithfully use what we've been given. The story shows us that even small efforts, although I have to admit, dealing with foster kids and, and so forth, small efforts are relative because the trauma and the anger and so forth are real. But it's small compared to you know, having 10,000 people come to Jesus on the day of Pentecost or, or whatever the case may be. But Annie would have never come around if she wouldn't have used her talent and wouldn't have had, used the gift of patience and love in the ways that she did. If she would have just written her off because she was difficult and, and mean and whatever, who knows what would have happened to the Helen Keller story. That difference truly does make a difference in people's lives. And finally, that whole thing, that whole story about doubling the talents and so forth like that, if we keep it just on a monetary level, we've missed the point. Jesus is talking about our whole beings, our mind, body, and souls, all the gifts that are wrapped up in each of our packages, so to speak. And the call is to unwrap each and every one of those and use them fully. Not for making extra money for ourselves, but to make the mission of God our mission. And using those gifts whether we're a superstar athlete that can make $10 billion a year or, or those of us that are on the little lower level that, that maybe don't have as much athletic or as much intellectual or, or good looks or strength or whatever the case may be, whatever measure of talent that we have, God makes it enough in the mission area that we're assigned and called to serve. We have the opportunity to recognize our potential in the call that God has issued us simply by being faithful with what he gives us and not wondering if it's enough or if it's the right skill because God makes it right. God blesses us with what is needed in a time like this. And that in itself is a great gift. It's kind of like a marathon runner. Those of you that have ever run a marathon, I don't think any of us in this room have, but I, I suspect that somebody listening has at least tried a longer run. The feeling of finishing is at least close to as if you finished first. Because you ran the distance. And you may not have been the fastest one, but you got the mission done. Jesus calls us into that glory of being a faithful servant, not because we all have five talents, or because we made big, huge mountains of success, but because there's no greater joy 
then living a life of love and faithfulness, and then joining the rest of the party when we're done. No matter our situation, no matter our talent level, no matter what the talents are, Jesus has called each and every one of us and given us enough and walks with us to serve. Your talent is God-given, and he doesn't make junk. May we stand and sing. Let me get to the hymn here. O oh, Jesus, joy of loving hearts, number 658. church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to touch the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now longing for Christ's reign to come among us, we pray for the outpouring of God's power on the church, the world, and all in need for those that are able Please kneel. Lord of the church, ignite your people with the passion of your love. By the fire of your Holy Spirit, unify us across ministries, congregations, and denominations, 
and refine us to participate in your activity throughout the world. Hear us, O God. Lord of creation, we stand in awe at the works of your hands and praise you for the beauty of the nature, whether it's the rivers, whether it's our state parks, or our national parks. Bless the earth for your glory and restore its integrity where exploitation has caused ruin. Hear us, O God. Lord of the nations, sound forth your justice in the ears of all leaders. Increase concern for those who are most vulnerable, especially as international leaders forge trade agreements and cooperate to end human rights abuses. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Lord of all in need, search out all who cry to you in distress. Scatter the heavy clouds of depression, chronic illness, unemployment, and loneliness with your radiant light. Send us as encouragement signs of your healing. And gracious Lord, we especially lift up Jim, Pastor Lisa, Gail, Jackie, Debbie, Gail, Sandy, Cash, Paul, Ted, Juanita, Stephanie, Barb, George, Roger, Phil, Kathy, Sean, Randy, Patty, Kathy, Sandra, Tom, and all those others that we lift up in our hearts. Hear us, O God. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for those who serve with us in sharing your love and living out each and everyone's talents. And we especially lift up Zion and Middletown and their pastor, Jen, as well as the House of Deliverance Ministries and their pastors, Greg and Judy. Be with them and us as we faithfully serve using the talents you've given us. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Lord of the stranger, stir up holy restlessness in us to extend love to those at the margins. Release our desire for control and open us to learn from the perspectives of others. Hear us, O God. Lord of the living and the dead, we give you thanks for all the saints that rest from their labors. Rouse us to live by their example, that saints yet to come may know your love. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, until that day when you gather all creation around your throne, where you will reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. It's also with you. And God's peace with everyone at home.
Now let us pray. God, all goodness, generations have turned to you, gathered around your table, and shared your abundant blessings. Number us among them that as we gather these gifts from your abundance and give thanks for your rich blessings, we may feast upon your very self and care for all that you have made through Jesus Christ, our sovereign and servant. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty, and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, O Lord, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, surrounded by evil and bordered by death, we appeal to you, our sovereign, our wisdom, and our judge. We praise you for Christ who welcomed your reign of peace and promised an end to injustice and harm. In the night which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it for all to eat, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, the sacrifice of his life and death and the victory of his resurrection, we await with all the saints in his loving redemption of our suffering world. Send your spirit on these gifts of bread and wine and on all who share in the body and blood of your Son. Teach us your mercy and justice and make all things new in Christ. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. And together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, who, who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. There is a place for you at the banquet. Come and feast at Jesus' table. And just as a reminder, for those of you that aren't in the singing team, please go around. And the little purple dots are the grape juice.
Please stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in this simple meal, you have set a banquet. Sustain us on the journey, strengthen us to care for the least of your beloved children, and give us glad and generous hearts as we meet you on the way. Amen. May the God of all creation, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved, who strengthens us for service, give you reason to rejoice and be glad. The blessing of God, Sovereign, Savior, and Spirit be with you today and always. Amen. Amen. And we close with Win Peace Like a River, 785. <laughs>
peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.